60 Minutes Rewind. It's always been a dream of mankind to live forever. Since the start of the 20th century, we have increased life expectancy in this country by a remarkable 30 years, from just 49 in 1900 to almost 79 today. And more and more of us are making it into that group we all hope and kind of dread joining, the over 90 crowd. Affectionately dubbed the oldest old, men and women above the age of 90 are now the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. Yet very little is known about the oldest old, since until recently there were so few of them. So what determines which of us will make it past age 90? What kind of shape will be in if we do? And what can we do to up our odds? Finding out is the goal of a groundbreaking research study known as 90 plus. I was born on April 21st, 1914. My birthday is February 7th, 1918. I was born on August 25th, 1920, and I'm 93 plus. June 15, 1918, and it was, a, I'm sure, a lovely day. <laughs> do you feel 95? What, do you, what age I do you feel? I feel about 52. <laughs> Not really. What they have in common, other than having lived a combined total of almost 400 years, is that decades ago, they all lived in a retirement community called Leisure World, 45 miles south of Los Angeles. Hi there, and welcome to Leisure World. A new way of life designed for alert and active people 52 years or older who want to get the most out of life. Today, it's still a retirement community, and they're still getting the most out of life though it's no longer called Leisure World. It's now its own city, Laguna Woods. They didn't like the words Leisure World. <laughs> they consider themselves active. Active World. Mm -hmm. Active World. Dr. Claudia Kawas spends a lot of time in Laguna Woods these days. She's a neurologist and professor at nearby UC Irvine who discovered the research equivalent of gold here information gathered from thousands of Leisure World residents back in 1981 with page after page of data about their diet, exercise, vitamins, and activities. 14,000 people 14, answered 000. this questionnaire in 1981. Many of them, if they were still alive, would now be over the age of 90. She saw a rare opportunity to study what worked and what didn't. So you, did you try to find them? We went after all 14,000, and if they were still alive, we wanted to find where they were. With $6 million of funding from the National Institutes of Health, KWAS and her team set out to find out who had died, when they died, and to convince those who were still living and over 90 to sign up. And you're how old now? I'll be 103 months. We're going to have to have a party. Good. Jane Whistler. <laughs> I love a party is one of the more than 1,600 men and women they found and enrolled as subjects in the 90-plus study. They are checked from top to bottom every six months. Big smile. Their facial muscles. Excellent. Reflexes. You. Balance. Three, four, five. How they walk. <laughs> how fast they can four, stand up and sit five. down. Fantastic. <laughs> and most importantly, how their minds are working. I'm gonna say and show you three words for you to remember. Shirt, brown, honesty. Shirt, brown, honesty. Perfect. Now please spell world. They are given an hour-long battery of cognitive and memory tests. Good, now spell world backwards. D-L-R-O-W. Ask to connect letters and numbers. There you go. And to remember. All right, what three words did I ask you to remember earlier? Brown, mm -hmm. shirt, mm -hmm. You want a little hint? Yeah. OK. Was that word honesty, charity, honesty. or modesty? Honesty. Yes. When it's time for your exams in the 90 plus study, do you look forward to it or? Sure. Do you ever say, oh, they're going to find something or I'm not going to be able to do as well as I did last time? Oh, yeah, I think that. Sure. You do. 
but that doesn't stop me. I think it's, I think it's fun. Shirt, brown, honesty. We were struck by what great shape many of the study participants are in. Excellent, 13 seconds. Like Lou Torado, a World War II B-17 gunner who was shot down near Berlin and spent eight months as a German POW. And Sid Shiro, another World War II veteran who came to talk to us despite having suffered a stroke just a few weeks earlier that slurred his speech. I am 92 years old and going strong. Sid drives his car to his test sessions. You drive a convertible. You want the girls to look at you. Uh, they call it the chick car. Sid, a widower, works out at the fitness center, keeps up with the news and the ladies. So you're a bachelor. Yes. Do you date? Yes. Do you have a rich social life? Yes. Is it fun? Yes. <laughs> Very much so. And I hope to last a long time. But of course, not everyone is so lucky. When participants like Louise Bigelow, age 97, are too frail to come in for testing, the testers go to them. An orange and a banana are alike because they're both yellow. Yeah. Louise remembers events from long ago, like when her bridal veil caught fire a few minutes after this photo was taken. It went right into the flames of the candles. So I always had a lot of excitement all the time. <laughs> and that was the beginning. You're not going to forget that, ever. No. no. But when it comes to recent memories and thinking skills, she struggles more and more. And in what way are laughing and crying alike? I don't know. No. <laughs> Brown, honesty, and uh, shirt. The testers go to 95-year-old Ruthie Stahl's home, too. They go not because she can't come to them. She just doesn't have time. I'm in my car more than I'm in the house, I think, because I, I do so many things. What do you do? I am flying all over the place. Flying, as in speed walking, three miles almost every day. On Sunday, it's only two miles. <laughs> Are you on the computer? Yes, I am, but I'm having trouble with my computer. I had a computer for 10 years and enjoyed it, but it died. Jane outlived her computer. At almost 100, she's done a lot of outliving. We were all bridge players. We'd play bridge and have dinner, and it was a lot of fun. Have some of them died? They've all died. They've all died? Everyone. Oh, my goodness. I'm the only one left. So what was it that got these people into their 90s? So you've never had a stroke? No. While their spouses, friends, and colleagues never had hardly anything dropped out along the way. What's uh, your secret? I wish I knew. Genes clearly contribute to longevity, says Kawas, but they aren't everything. Jane Whistler's parents both died when she was young. Well, whatever your secrets are, by being in the study, we're going to try to find them out. So you can go back and look at their medical history. Everybody in the study filled out that questionnaire in the early 1980s. And comparing that data to how it's all turned out has yielded a slew of published findings about behaviors associated with living longer. So what's the verdict? No surprise, smokers died earlier than non-smokers. And what about exercise? People who exercised definitely lived longer than people who didn't exercise. A little as 15 minutes a day on average made a difference. 45 was the best. Even three hours didn't beat 45 oh, minutes wow, a day. Oh, wow, that's interesting. And it didn't all have to be at once. It could be, for example, 15 minutes of walking and then later in the day, gardening or something. And it also didn't have to be very intense exercise. And non-physical activities, book clubs, socializing with friends, board games, all good. For every hour you spent doing activities in 1981, you increased your longevity. And the benefit of those things never leveled off. The subjects we spoke to had definitely been active, but they didn't strike us as having lived their lives worrying about their health. I'm not a big vitamin person. Have you watched over the years what you ate? Uh, not, not really. Dessert? Sure, I love dessert. <laughs>
I always had a glass of wine before dinner, and now I still do, but I can't quite finish it. Clean living, huh? No. No, <laughs> not clean living. I don't know what clean living is. What about alcohol? Sure. I love wine. Do you take vitamins? Yes, a lot of them. So which vitamins helped? Antioxidants? Okay, vitamin E. We are, we're sitting at the edge of our chairs. Did it make a difference? Vitamin it was e? my favorite, but mm -mm. no. People who took vitamin E didn't live any longer than people who didn't take vitamin E. They also looked at vitamin A, C, and calcium. The short answer is none of them made a difference. None of them made a difference to living in terms of how long you live. What about alcohol? Oh. Alcohol made a difference. But it may not be what you think. Moderate alcohol was associated with living longer than individuals who did not consume Wait alcohol. A a moderate alcohol, you live longer? Yes. Up to two drinks a day led to a 10 to 15 percent reduced risk of death compared to non-drinkers. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and any kind of alcohol seemed to do the trick. A lot of people like to say it's only red wine. Yeah. In our hands, it didn't seem to matter. Martini's just as good. Yeah. And there's good news for coffee drinkers. Caffeine intake, equivalent to one to three cups of coffee a day, was better than more or none. And if you're concerned about those bulging waistlines, listen to this. It turns out that the best thing to do as you age is to at least maintain or even gain weight. Gain weight? Mm -hmm. So being a, a little overweight is, is good? Being obese is never good. And being overweight as a young person wasn't good either. But late in life, they found people who were overweight or average weight both outlived people who were underweight. It's not good to be skinny when you're old. But living a long time, even if we don't have to watch our waistlines, isn't the only thing most of us care about. We want to be all there to enjoy it. Thank you very much. And it's in the areas of Alzheimer's and dementia that the 90-plus study is generating some of its most provocative and surprising findings. We'll tell you about that. And one more thing, <laughs> romance. After 90? How's your sex life? <laughs> you brought it up. When we come back. <laughs> the story will continue after this. We are a nation getting older. By the middle of the century, the number of Americans aged 90 and above is projected to quadruple. While that's good news for those of us who want to stick around, it also means more time, literally, to start to lose our minds. Dementia, including that most dreaded form, Alzheimer's disease, is a looming threat and a primary focus of the 90-plus study. Participants are asked to donate their brains to the study after they die so researchers can compare what they saw in life to the secrets buried deep within. And the picture isn't always matching up, bringing new discoveries and new questions about what may actually be causing dementia in the oldest old and what we may be able to do about it. You know, I think that it was common belief that if you got to 90, and you didn't have dementia or Alzheimer's, that you weren't going to get it. Unfortunately, no. I really, really expected to find that. But in our study, that's not to happen. It's not true. No. Oh, 62. It turns out the risk of developing dementia doubles every five years, starting at the age of 65. And it keeps right on doubling. Bingo! And given the growth in numbers of the oldest old by mid-century... We are going to have more people with dementia over the age of 90 than we currently have at all ages put together. We're not even thinking about it. We should be. Where do we start? As charming and engaging as all the 90-plusers we met were, one who we were particularly Perfect. moved by was 96-year-old right. Ted Rosenbaum, a former American history teacher who's been married for 63 years. You still look lovely to me. <laughs> I was very lucky. So now at this stage of the game, if it's petering out, just reminiscing about our past 
is a source of incalculable joy. An orange and a banana are alike because they're both fruits. Exactly. Ted did well on parts of the 90-plus okay. exam, like repeating long strings of numbers backwards. Six, one, eight, four, three. Three, four, eight. One, six. But when it came time to remember the three words she had told him just 40 seconds earlier. Three words. Yep. Give me a hint. He was lost. Three words. And that wasn't his only problem. What is today's date? Today's date? Mm-hmm. Today's date. Does he have dementia at this point? Yes, he Ted does. has dementia. Mm. You know, unfortunately, there's no blood tests, there's no x-ray. Mm -hmm. It's an examiner finding out that an individual has problems in two or more of the main things the brain does for them. So that's where he is. And what's perhaps the most devastating is he knows it. My worst condition is my memory. When you can't remember something, what goes on inside you? Terrible frustration, terrible, you know, it, it's, it's, it's having more and more of a negative impact on me psycho psychologically. Determining what's behind his memory loss isn't easy, since diseases like Alzheimer's can only be definitively diagnosed in the brain after death. So it's after the 90-plusers die that a new round of sleuthing begins. When subjects in the study donate their brains, they come here to neuropathologist Dr. Ronald Kim. He showed us one of the things he always looks for, the plaques and tangles in the brain that are the telltale signs of Alzheimer's disease. It forms all of these plaques. All these brown spots yes, are plaques. Yes, plaques, that's correct. And in an individual like this, I would expect the patient to be demented. You read newspapers every day? Yes, I read them in the evening. Loring Bigelow spent five years in the study. He passed away last summer, and while Dr. Kim studies his brain, the rest of the 90-plus team independently reviews years of his test results and videos to assess whether he had developed dementia, and if so, from what? While early on, his scores were strong. Who is our president? Obama. Over the years, there was a gradual but unmistakable decline. He'd pick up a newspaper he had just finished, use the TV remote to try and make a phone call. Do you know who is the president? <laughs> I want to say her before. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> I can't think of it. Not remember his age, anxious. The consensus here was likely Alzheimer's, Definitely. which presumes a brain with plaques and tangles. Are we ready to hear the truth? Only then do they open up Dr. Kim's report. Uh, plaques, zero. So no plaques. Ah, okay. actually, wow. Wow. no cortical tangles anywhere. <laughs> Pretty amazing. What's amazing is they're finding that 40% of the time in people over 90, what Anybody doctors would think is Alzheimer's isn't. In Loring Bigelow's brain, Dr. Kim found something else, something the 90-plus study is finding quite a bit, evidence of tiny microscopic strokes called microinfarcts. His brain was full of them. Here is a microinfarct. It's oh, the hole, right this, which is basically a tiny stroke. So you've got all this tissue is missing. If you find one, it suggests that you should probably look for others, and some patients may have hundreds or thousands of them. These microscopic strokes are insidious because people don't even know they're having them. They can be totally silent, and slowly but surely over, over time, you're picking off, you're disconnecting your cortex from the rest of the brain, and then you start to become demented. It can look just like Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. clinically. Do you know anything we can do to prevent these mini strokes? I wish I did, but I will soon, I hope. Kawa okay. suspects one thing that may cause them is low blood pressure, and she has some evidence. 
While none of the factors from the original Leisure World study, vitamins, alcohol, caffeine, even exercise, seem to lower people's risk of getting dementia, the 90-plus study discovered that high blood pressure did. If you have high blood pressure, it looks like your risk of dementia is lower. Lower? Than if you high, don't have high wait, blood pressure. High blood pressure, lower risk of dementia. In a 90-year-old. Yeah. High blood pressure is still dangerous if you're younger. Yet another reason, she says, it's so important to study the oldest old. Most of what we know, we study in much younger individuals, and 50, 60, maybe 70-year-olds. And then we just kind of assume that the same thing should happen in older people. And you're saying we shouldn't? I think we shouldn't. Take this next counterintuitive finding, this time in the 90-plus subjects who have no dementia. We're finding out that if you die without dementia in this age group, about half the time you still have plaques and tangles in your head. No. So you can exhibit Alzheimer's and not have plaques and tangles half the time, and the reverse? Both directions. You're, you're fine and you do have plaques and tangles? So what do you make of that? I mean, one possibility is that plaques and tangles have nothing to do with it. But it might be that plaques and tangles are very, very important, but just a 90-year-old who has them and didn't develop thinking problems has some way of getting around them that maybe all the rest of us would like to know. So now they're looking at people with no signs of dementia, like Ruthie Stahl, Lou Torado, Sid Sherrill, and Jane Whistler, to see if they have plaques and tangles but are not affected by them. There's a new type of PET scan was it? that for the first time makes it possible to find plaques during life. Let me help you with that. So the 90-plus study is engaged in the delicate task of putting 99-year-olds like Jane Whistler into scanners. Sid Shiro, at 92, hopped right in. Jane and Sid both have very, very, very good thinking, as you saw. Yes, de definitely. And it turns out that one of their scans is positive and one is negative. She showed them to us, one on top of the other. Yellow and red indicate the presence of amyloid plaque. This is Miss Whistler and this is Mr. Shiro. Well, Sid I'm Shiro? surprised, having talked to him, that I'm seeing yellow and red here. Mm-hmm. Kind of stunning. Hello, Mr. Shiro. Dr. K was. So what does that mean for Sid? The positive scan means statistically he's at greater risk of cognitive decline. But Dr. Kawa says the fact that he's doing so well in spite of the plaque in his brain and his stroke means he may have that something protective and special that could help the rest of us. She says they'll be keeping a close watch on him. If it's unclear that the pathology hooks up with what you're seeing, what does that mean in your mind? I, th I think we're looking for too simple an answer. I think we want one thing to explain yeah. Alzheimer's. L look at something different, like what, what makes skin wrinkle? Well, I mean, getting older makes skin wrinkle. Being in the sun too much makes skin wrinkle. Not taking care of your diet. And you put all those together and they all contribute. And I think it might turn out to be the same for our, our thinking, especially in late life, that it's not just Alzheimer's pathology from plaques or not just microinfarcts, but the number of these hits that you take. And after a while, you can't withstand them all. Let me hold a chair for you. There's one last thing we wondered about in the over 90 crowd, and that's romance. Helen Weil, 92, and Henry Tornell, 94, both widowed, have been dating for three years. So do you see each other every day, several times every day, yeah. once a day? How does it work? She gets one day off a week. <laughs> it's true. Tuesday is one. <laughs> Tuesday is a day off. It's my day off. Well, Helen and Henry love well, being part of the 90-plus study, and I both know. have signed up to donate their brains time. after they die. So Henry has only one problem with the whole enterprise what the study hasn't asked about. I asked them, aren't you going to ask us any questions about our sex life? And they said, no. Well, I will. How's your sex life? <laughs> you brought it up. You see, he is funny. You know that. Well, I don't know. I think, I, I'm not laughing. How's your sex life? <laughs> He's blushing. He's blushing. Uh, but is that part of, do you think that has something to do with? I would say it has a big part. Helen? 
We are very emotional. <laughs> we are very affectionate. But do you think that sex is a, an important part of staying young? Yes. Okay, are we all ready? The 90-plus study has just gotten another five-year round of NIH funding to delve deeper into risk factors for specific types of dementia, like those micro-infarcts, and to search for genes that may be protective in their continuing search for the secrets of the oldest old. I really believe that when we learn things from the 90-year-olds, they're going to be helping the 60- and 70-year-olds, not just how to become 90-year-olds, but how to do it with style and as good a function as possible. Well, obviously, you've already started that by telling us that we should have some wine, that we should have <laughs> some coffee. And socialize and exercise. And gain weight. And that's my favorite. My favorite, too. <laughs> Absolutely.